welcome good morning let's stand and worship God together let's sing out as loud as you can make a joyful noise I search the world and I search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures and faith never enough then you came along put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing Afraid. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all till you call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley.
Jesus. All right, pray with me, please. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for all that have gathered. Lord, I pray that you would make our hearts and minds ready that we might receive the fullest of your blessings. Bless our time together, Lord, and I pray that we would minister to one another as you minister unto us. Amen. Good morning from Kid Street as well. We're just saying that Jesus, that's a powerful name, right? We've been talking about what it means to have Jesus as the leader of our lives, right? We say, I've asked Jesus into my heart that I believe in Christ, right? So we've been talking about what that means. And so we're, you know, I'm wearing a, a funny looking outfit here, right? So we looked at some scriptures that talked about, you know, what it meant. Do you just get baptized and then go back to the way you were living before? You're fine. You got baptized once. You're good, right? Getting baptized is kind of like a bath, the symbol of going under the water, right? Coming out of the water, a new creature. Hope, hope you just don't take one bath, right? You need another one, right? And another one. Right? Christ says you walk with him daily. So we had a couple of scriptures that we were reading. In Romans 13, 14. Actually, this is 13, 12. It says, so remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. So show them your white shirt, right? That was kind of like our shining armor of white living, right? White kind of stands for being pure, right? And new and fresh, okay? And then in Colossians 3, verse 10, it started with, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So that's what we're doing when we're young, right? We're learning. We're learning about the Bible, about Jesus. There's a lot of adults that are still learning how to be like our creator, okay? So some of the things on our shirts stood for some things. What was one thing that you drew that you would want to share? The cross. All right, and what does the cross stand for on your shirt? Jesus. All right, so following Jesus, right? Okay, and on yours, you had what? Love. Love, and what was the symbol of on your shirt for love? Heart. Yeah, the heart, okay. I've got some others here, right? Harmony, peace, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, right? That's the way that we live our lives if we are a Christian, okay? We don't just say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe in Christ, and then go back to the way we were, God wants us to live with him daily. So we try and put on our new clothes every day. Start your day in prayer and ask him for help to be more like him. All right? So let's pray and then let's worship the Lord that gives us a new start. Dear God, we thank you for cleaning us and making us new, for forgiving us, for giving us new life. Through Christ, help us to wear our Christ clothes wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. This first song is number 122 in your red hymnal. Tell me the story of Jesus. Fasting 
Father God, we just ask that you would be with us today, and for those that can't be with us, Lord, we also ask that you would give comfort and peace to those who've lost loved ones, just surround us with their, your love and care and the joy that others can bring and the memories that they get to hold on to, Lord. I also ask that you would uh, be with Pastor Kevin as he recovers from uh, throwing his back out. Lord, just ask that you give him some healing and be able to recover quickly. And Father, please take our tithes and offerings this morning and use them for the betterment of your kingdom and according to your will. Amen.
What fortune lies beyond the stars Those dazzling heights too vast to climb I got so high to fall so far But I found heaven as love swept low turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Being that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, we're going to talk about love. But not love in the traditional sense. It's going to be love more in the sense of actually what Dave was talking about with the kids. It's a progressing, growing, maturing love. A love that is going to grow and change from faith to hope in Jesus Christ. So we're going to be breaking down the attributes of love and the final statement there, which is in verse 13 of chapter 13, is where we're going to find our final point there. But before we do that, we're going to pray as we always do every week, usually with Kevin. But today with me, uh, obviously, let's definitely pray for Kevin. Let's also not forget others who are hurting, whether it be physically or emotionally. We've had many who have experienced loss, whether it be because of COVID or otherwise. And uh, really all around us, the Lord has given opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ to those who are hurting. I know myself, in other workplaces, in other social circumstances, the fields are ready for harvest because people need a Savior right now. But with that said, I'll give everybody a moment to pray, and then I'll go ahead and pray for us.
Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the amazing love, Lord, that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through your many attributes and characteristics, Lord. You are love. I pray that we would come to understand in a greater way who you are and what love is as it is from you. I pray for those who are hurting with physical ailments, Lord. I pray that you would meet those needs. Give healing, Lord, where I know you can. And give peace to the hearts whereby your divine will there is another path. Lord, I pray for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, I pray for the souls of those individuals that you would comfort and care and love them, Lord. I love you and thank you so much for all your many blessings. Amen. As I said, if you hadn't turned there already, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to start out here with an analogy here. I had, in a previous home, I had a basement. You know, basements are usually, you know, either that or a garage or hopefully both. It's where you will find the man of the house, whether it be in a man cave or I call mine a man's sanctuary because uh, it is a sanctuary to all men, even when we're suffering uh, a, a terrible loss with the Super Bowl or whatever it may be. <laughs> but uh, it's a place where, you know, it was my place in my old home. And it had uh, gotten flooded a couple of times. The carpet was ruined. And we'd already claimed it on insurance once, and we thought, well, we can't claim it again. I mean, we could, but it would have cost a lot of money. And so I thought, you know what? Because this was the reasoning in my mind. I could lay tile in that basement. Now, I said that because, number one, I was young and dumb. I didn't realize that laying tile was difficult, that it was hard. I also knew, though, to pay somebody, it was going to be way too expensive. So in my mind, I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I can lay the tile. And uh, so we got the tile, and, you know, it was one of those, you know, I know this guy who knows this guy. I get me some tile and that kind of thing. And got the tiles, big 16-inch square tiles, huge tiles. And I, I uh, watched a bunch of YouTube tutorials. I felt pretty confident, you know, and I put the mortar on and laid the tiles down and I had the knee pads because my knees were hurting. I had blisters underneath, you know. And that was just from the first day. I got about half of it done. And the, the next day I come downstairs to work on it some more. And I realized that I hadn't mixed my mortar thick enough. So those heavy 16-inch tiles sank through the mortar. And the mortar was coming up past the tiles. And I thought, well, I'll mix this one thicker and I'll figure that out, you know. And so I thought I'd mixed it thicker. Not for 16-inch tiles. Again, the tiles sank down. And I actually had some help the second day for my nephew because I was not going to be able to do it on my own. My knees hurt so bad. And I got almost all of it done, and I'd run out of tile. Well, I got the tile from a guy in Springfield who had kind of, who, he knew a guy who knew a guy who got me a good deal on tile. And uh, I told him, I said, oh, I don't have enough tile. And it was because I was using real thin spaces between my tiles for one. And for two, you know, I'd probably cut more than I probably should have and wasted some tiles because, again, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, so long story short, they got me more tile. But instead of being 16 inches, they were 12 inches. Yeah. So I thought, well, okay, what am I going to do? All right, I'm going to go to Home Depot, and I, I got some other little decorative tiles, and I actually was able to do three rows of the 12 with uh, a little four or six-inch square tiles along the sides doing kind of an entry edging kind of thing coming off the steps. And it actually looked really nice, other than, again, you know, they all, I, somehow I could never mix the mortar thick enough. They always sank through. And so once all that got done, then I, I got a flathead screwdriver, and I had to scrape all that mortar out. It was a squared 
flathead screwdriver, you know, one of those about a quarter inch wide. By the time I was done scraping all that mortar out, it was about, uh, I don't know, quarter to half inch shorter. And it was no longer square. It was nice and round. And I just scrubbed, you know, on my knees again, some blisters again. But I finally got that done. I was able to, to wipe in the, the grout and all that stuff. And I finally got it all done. But it all started because I had faith in myself that I could get it done. And I got about halfway done. And yeah, it wasn't perfect. Yeah, mistakes had been made. But when I saw about half of it done, I thought, I have hope that I'm going to have a basement again. And I, I say those two things there, and I say them separately because when you look at Scripture, faith and hope are two very separate, very different things. And in my mind, in today's day and age, you think of hope and faith, you think of them as the same thing. But again, scripturally, they're very different. And so we're going to look here, again, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13, particularly at verse 13, and we're going to see that the two are mentioned, and they are for a reason, and we're going to break what those two things are in Scripture down, and the journey that one takes from faith to hope as we discover the deeper, truer, fuller love of Jesus Christ. And that whole experience with the tile, by the way, that took me months, months of working on the weekends. But thankfully, I mean, we sold that house and only one tile had cracked. And I think we hit it well enough nobody knew. So, <laughs> but uh, oh, that was an undertaking. And uh, when I laid tile the next time, somehow I thought it would be easier, but it wasn't because I ended up laying tile again upstairs in the kitchen. And that was, that's a whole other story. But, because <laughs> we was upstairs, so we had to do concrete board. It was a big mess. Um, but if we can, we're going to look now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm actually going to back up because I think it's important when we talk about discovering true love. We got to know what the Bible defines as what love is. And we find that right here further up, starting at verse 4. And I'm going to read that. It says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wrong. Wronged, excuse me. It does not rejoice about injustice. It rejoices whenever the truth, truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I read that from the NLT, the New Living Translation there, because that's a more practical, rubber hits the road kind of interpretation of that. And we, we see already the, the introductions of verse 13. And I'll go ahead and read that. Is, and it says there, but now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. And like I was saying earlier, I read this verse because we were actually going through love, you know, because uh, as, as a youth pastor here, teenagers, you know, they might think a little bit about love and relationship, boyfriends, girlfriends. I mean, not a whole lot, you know. They're not, there's none of them, I'm sure, that are boy crazy or girl crazy. I certainly wasn't when I was a teenager either, right? <laughs> Hopefully you can hear my sarcasm there. But I, when I did read verse 13 there, I, did, I, see, I saw the distinction there. Faith, hope, and love. It made me scratch my head a little bit, and I had to do some study. So, that red is hard to read. Do you think I would learn my lesson on that too? Because I've done red before, and we couldn't read it last time either. 
I apologize for that. You're just going to have to listen extra close, aren't you? But as we talk about faith, hope, and love, let's talk about faith first. Obviously, we have a wonderful definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I always use the analogy when describing this, especially when I'm talking with kids, but I'm reminded of when I was in first grade, I had a crush on a girl. Her name was Kimmy Walden. And I had a big crush on her. And I'm wearing a suit now, but believe it or not, I would find suits at the thrift stores and I would wear them to school. And they'd, why are you wearing a suit? I'm dressed up for Kimmy Walden. And they'd giggle. You're so weird. And uh, you know, you know how first graders are. But uh, I did. And um, it was because in first grade, she reciprocated that. I didn't catch the hint in second, third, fourth, or fifth grade that she wasn't interested anymore. <laughs> but first grade, I was all about it. And it was because, so when I go to describe faith, and faith is the substance of things hoped for. So I had a crush on her, you know, a little first, first grader crush. She never told me that she liked me or anything. But I would look at her from across the classroom, and she'd look back, and she'd grin. Maybe giggle a little bit and then look away. That was the substance. That was it right there. Faith is the substance of what we hope for. That was the substance of what I was putting my hope in. And we even see that dynamic there because we have the faith and then the hope. Hope's where the rubber hits the road. The hope is where we take action. Where we take what we know is in here and we put it to work. As a first grader, that was a really easy example. But as adults, it's not that simple, is it? We can't always fake it till we make it. But there's a journey that has to take place. We look around at the world today. We look at Christians here in the U.S. in general. We look at them across the nation and across the globe. Christianity doesn't seem to have the effectiveness that it once had, does it? When people think of Christians nowadays, they think of bigots and people who hate people who are different. We've got to ask ourselves, why? Why do people have that stigma about us now? What is that perception Some of it's them, but some of it is because we have not truly lived out the love of Jesus Christ as we should have to this world. And it's because we haven't taken that journey from what is just faith and made it into our blessed hope. So talking about hope, we can look at Romans chapter 5 verse 5. You don't have to turn there necessarily, I'll tell you. Um, and actually starting at verse 4 experience gives us hope and hope makes us unashamed because the blood of God is shed abroad in our hearts we can have hope in the love of Jesus Christ we can have hope in its power not just in our lives, but in the power of others through us. Because of that experience we've had in him. And lastly, with love, 1 John 4, 7, I'll go ahead and paraphrase it for you, God is love. If you abide in love, you abide in God. And it goes on to even elaborate that more. It repeats itself over and over again. And this is talking about, again, true love. The love we already mentioned. So now that we've got kind of a, a 
an outline of what we're going to be looking at here. Let's really dig in here. Let's look at faith. First thing about faith, and Debbie, I'm sorry, I am jumping around just a smidge. Not that it matters because it's red and they can't read it. But <laughs> this next one is going to switch. The white one's going to be red and the, the other part's going to be white. Yeah, see, there you go. Look at that. But it says there in the red part that you can't read. It says that faith should grow when tried. And you can look at this in Romans chapter 5. I love Romans chapter 5. I've got it memorized. It says we glory in tribulations also. Oh, hang on. I'm jumping ahead. First off, it says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By him also we have access into this grace wherein we stand. And we glory in tribulations also. I mean that tribulations works patience. But then also we have 1 Peter 6 there. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we're tried, going back to Romans chapter 5 there, tribulations brings about patience or perseverance, you could also say, depending on what translation you're reading. They're both, actually, they're both right. You smash them together, you've got the the, uh, really, the true definition of the, the Greek word there. But <clears throat> our faith should grow when we're tried. And I think, again, as, as Christians as a whole, again, when we look around, this is the failure, the first failure. It's like, oh no, he's going to do one of those sermons where he tells us everything we're doing wrong. Well, hang with me for a minute. But yes, our faith should grow when it's tried. Sadly, in church, in our homes, we'll try something scriptural. We'll try something that we know is right. And when it doesn't work right away, we think, well, you know, maybe it's just old and antiquated. Maybe it's an out-of-date idea. I tried. The Bible talks about being instant. In or out of season. Or in other words, being prepared whether it's needed or not. As Christians, our faith in Jesus Christ should be on point. Whether it's being tested or not. Whether people are asking us about it or not. When we're sitting at home alone, our faith should be on point. And then especially when it's tried. Well, then it's no longer about the trial. It's all about Jesus Christ. When Paul and Silas were in prison, they weren't singing and praising the Lord because they wanted to escape. They weren't singing and praising the Lord because they talked themselves into really liking being in prison. They did their worship and their songs to the Lord for one reason, one reason alone. Because their faith was not in their circumstances. Their faith was not in what they wanted. Their faith was not in anything that was there in that moment. Their faith was 100% in their relationship with Jesus Christ. They were doing the same thing right there that they would have been doing at home. Thought, well, you know... My prayer time, my worship time is to be a little different today because I'm in prison. No big deal. And when we, we can reach that mind state, when we can get to a place in our hearts where our faith is on point, God makes opportunity. Because he knows that he can use us. Paul and Silas, they were in prison. 
Because God was making an opportunity. Because everybody in that prison as a result, including the, the, uh, the prison guard, all received or at least heard the gospel through those events. In hindsight, does that really make prison that big a deal? No. Next, faith will be reinforced by God moving in our lives. I've got another verse here, 2 Peter 1.5. In view of all this, this being the promises of God, if you read the chapter, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And with brotherly affection, love for everyone. I got goosebumps because that verse, I could stop right there. That verse literally just told us everything we need to know. But just in case, I'm going to keep going. But so when God shows up, when we do our part, when we have ourselves ready, our faith is on point, as I was saying. God, you're it. You're in control. Lord, I love you. Lord, do whatever you have to do. Whatever it may be. God reinforces it. He re reinforces it with testimony. Because every single one of these things, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patient endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, love for everyone, almost every single one of those things are directly visible when we live them out. That's the kind of backup I want. I want God to be so alive in me that everybody can see it. And as we are still journeying through growth in our faith, heading towards hope, the blessed hope, realization of our salvation, Seeing God face to face. As we journey toward that point. My prayer is that I would live out my faith in such a way that people see it. That people know it. I told this story in Sunday school already and I warned them I'd be telling it again. I have a co-worker. She... Uh, going through some typical hard times, you know, nothing, nothing catastrophic. You know, there's no, she's not an addict or, or a drug user or, or uh, you know, she wasn't beaten by her ex-husband, but she did go through a divorce. It was a, uh, I guess you could call it a secular divorce where they just didn't see eye to eye on it, anything anymore and they just didn't get along and so they broke it off. And she's not a Christian woman and so this isn't necessarily something that should surprise anyone. It happens all the time, even in the church, sadly, nowadays. But so she, you know, and so she was juggling the divorce so she had the kids more and, and money obviously is tighter. And so the daily stresses of Really, what is regular life for most of us? She was going through those things and happened to see her on a Monday after a weekend. I said, hey, how are you? And knowing she was single, I said, hey, you, you breaking hearts? And um, she, she responded with, well, uh, I kind of. All right, then I knew it. So, okay, yeah, a heart was broken this weekend. It wasn't anybody else's, it was hers. And that's why I said it. So it, was, it sounds like your heart was the one that was broken. And, you know, 
She refused to cry, but her eyes did well up. And I said, look, where does your value come from? Does it come from what somebody else that you barely know? Does it come from what they think about you? Is that where your value comes from? Does it come from you meeting the standards of, of what you think being a mom is supposed to be? Because I don't know about you, I fail as a dad and a husband all the time. So if my value came from that, I wouldn't have a whole lot of value. And she's like, well, I guess I don't know. I told her, well, you know, your value comes from the fact that you were made for a reason, for a purpose, by a holy and righteous God. And God doesn't make trash. You are valuable to him. The best reinforcement we can have from God is when God moves through us. You know, I was very fortunate in that moment. Praise the Lord that I was a willing instrument in that moment because there are many times that I'm not. But praise the Lord, my faith was reinforced by getting to sow seeds of the gospel in telling her that Jesus Christ loves her. Fast forward, now that was, that was probably over a year ago. Fast forward, I get a strange phone call. On a, it was a Friday night, a week or two ago, and it was her. She needed more. You can pray for her. I won't tell you her name because I don't want to, in case she listens, I don't want to embarrass her, but pray for her, please. The unnamed young lady who is searching. She's seeking. And that was something that God did to reinforce my faith because I got to see God do that through me. And I thought, whoa, God, you are amazing. And we begin to see a transition. Now it's not so much, oh yeah, my faith, I got faith, God, I'm giving it to you, giving it to you, giving it to you. No, now I've got hope that maybe, maybe God, maybe you can change the world. Maybe the price you paid on the cross wasn't a waste. Maybe there are people who really do need you. Because I knew I did. But sometimes when I look around, it seems like everybody else has it all figured out and they've got it all put together. And then I, here I am, I'm thinking, I can't even lace, you know, a ceramic tile without having to stop and pray for God's grace because I'm about to cuss out a tile. But God, God is bigger. And God reinforced my faith in those moments. And as I've already alluded to, hope is the response. And I already mentioned Romans 5, but specifically there in verse 5, it says, um, well, I'll go ahead and back up a little bit here. We glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulations works patience and patience experience. And experience hope. And hope makes us unashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. See, that was the way I should have been doing it all along with the, the scripture being the most visible part. Because <laughs> that's the really important part. When God continually works in the life of a Christian, when I know from my own life, when God is continually working in me because I am striving to get my faith where it needs to be. And by that I mean I'm humbly saying, God, it's not me. It's all you. Well, then God shows up. He says, 
I'm so glad you're ready. Let's get to work, Russell. And then my faith is reinforced when I get to see him work through me. Nothing that I did. Everything that he did. I was just a vessel that had enough faith to be willing. That's all it took. And because of that, then I have this blessed hope that God can do anything he wants. Because his love is bigger than anything I could ever imagine or know. And that's where we begin to see what love really is. Now, verses, like we already saw in uh, Romans chapter 5 there, and then also in the 2 Peter 1, 5, where we see that transition. That's a circular process. Because it's a process of growth. Just like Pastor Dave was talking about with the kids. It's a process of growth. You know, you, you hear the analogy, people are like onions. We've all got layers. Our spiritual growth has layers too. You know, when I accepted Jesus Christ in my bed when I was five years old, praying that God would be my daddy, that love was different than love I know and understand now. And it's different because it's grown. I have discovered a greater depth of his love. And what a great love it is. I don't know where any of you may be in all of this. Maybe you've just accepted Christ. And you're getting to know who he is. Let me challenge and encourage you to grow in faith. When trials come, respond with faith. And he'll give you the experience you need to grow into greater faith. Maybe even into the hope of what? God may be willing and ready to do in your life. And maybe this whole love thing is not something you understood. You understood the love you see on TV and hear about on social media. God is bigger than any other kind of love that you may have heard or know. Here in a moment, Nate's going to come up and lead us in a, in a closing hymn. But first, I'd like to pray. If there's a decision you need to make today, maybe it's resentment, unwilling to forgive. I can tell you right now, that is the enemy of love. You know, Christ's love, the love of God, operates differently than ours. But ironically, not as different as you would think. You know, when I operate from what I love, it would seem very selfish. Because I'm in it for me, right? That's why society is falling apart the way that it is. We see love as something that profits us. But there's a deeper level even here on earth. You know, if somebody was to break into my home and threaten my family, I love my family dearly. And I'd be willing to give my life to defend them and stop that because I love them. We put that in God's perspective. God created each and every one of us. The spark, the ignition, the, the electrochemical reaction that occurred at our conception 
was not something we were capable of causing by any means of our own, but was done by a holy and righteous God. Knowing the hairs on your head already, knowing everything about you, Which is why he was actually very selfish himself when he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Because he loves his creation. He loves you. I don't know, again, I don't know what the needs may be. But I'm going to pray and step down here as they sing. And if you have a need you need to come forward, you make it real today, make it known. I'd be happy to pray with you. I'm sure there are others as well. But let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, pray for everybody here, Lord. You know all the needs, whether they be external, spoken, unspoken, secret needs, Lord. You know them all. But Lord, if there's something that needs to occur today in the lives of individuals, Lord, that they need to make real in this moment, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen and fortify their hearts, Lord, that they would make that decision now. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Please stand. child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, this child and forever I Before we pray, if any of you do have a need, on Kevin's behalf, since he's not here today, you'll be able to find me right outside the doors here if anybody needs to talk. Or if you're new here, I'd love to chat you up and get to know you. So, hey, here you go, Michelle. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for the message this morning. And just help us to be able to show your love to others, whether it's giving a listening ear or providing a hug to someone who needs it, a word of encouragement, no matter what that might be, Lord, I just ask that you would help us to open our eyes and to see the needs around us and to be able to help fulfill those needs with your love. Amen. <laughs>